Good evening and welcome to Pony Club Victoria webinar with guest presenter Mary Longdon. Mary will present schooling, coaching and performance for grade three and two tonight. This is the second session of a three part series. We recently held a presentation for grades four, five, six, and that can be viewed uh, on our Facebook page if you missed that recording. And we will also be offering our last presentation for grade one and advanced level riders on the evening of Thursday, 22nd of October. So keep an eye out for advertising of that. Pony Club Victoria will shortly release new tests for grades one to five, plus horse trials tests for grades two, one and advanced. These will come into effect from 1st of January 2021 and will be used at state championships in 2021. Tonight is a chance to get some tips and tricks on writing these level tests. Before we begin, I would like to introduce Mary. Mary is very well known in judging and coaching circles. Mary is a former Grand Prix level judge, three day event I level judge, Pony Club Victoria State level judge. She has also judged at the Olympic and World Championship level in para equestrian. Mary has a master's in special education. Her interest lies in coaching both abled, able-bodied and people with disability and coach education. She has a real interest in grassroots coaching and ensuring that people are able to ride to the best of their ability. Mary has been lucky to travel all over the world to do just this. Thank you, Mary. And uh, we shall begin. Thank you very much. Um, yes, so it's going to be really good. Here we've got a really nice picture of a typical, nicely going grade three horse. So thank you, Shakea. Um, the horse looks as if it's forward. It's perfectly happy. She's riding it with a steady rein contact. Uh, and for grade three, and it looks as if it was tracking up. Um, that's pretty nice. So we'll go on to the next one. And here, uh, this is 13.3. So judges, it's always a complete nightmare when you have off the track horses, warm bloods and ponies of all different shapes and sizes, but all in the same competition. But this pony is clearly going very nicely it's what I really like about it is that it looks so confident it's completely confident in the rider in the rein contact so it doesn't really matter what size the pony or horse is this is what we're looking at and I imagine this pony has probably gone up to grade two that looks pretty good okay next one Okay, I've got different drawings from my book, Coach with Courage, which I'm using, um, and they're copyright to myself. So if anybody would like to use them, please ask me, and then I will give you permission. But it needs to be a written permission. Thank you. Next one. Okay, so these are the expected standards and I think it's really important to know what are we actually looking at with the development of these riders and horses and in the guidelines it says that it's to encourage the horse to move forward at a steady pace into a contact and that the rider's hands are more steady and the position is more balanced uh, it's tricky to, because it doesn't actually say what it is. It just says more balanced um, and more forward than grade four. But what you have to do if you're judging is you've got to look at uh, what your expectation of that grade is. And then the figures have to be accurate now and the transitions on the markers. So you're asking for more of a performance and correctness. Okay. And then these are what they have to do in grade three. So suddenly they're in a 20 by 60 arena and they've 
the circles are from E and B, A and C, and also the one where you turn at E and B and you do your 20 meter circles from X. So all of a sudden your riders have to really know all the possible circles, 20 meter circles in the big arena. They also have to do a three loop serpentine and then uh, EX 10 meter half circle and then XG down the center line. But it's quite, it's really important that they know where they're going on the 20 meter circles because that's the base of the future in the big arena. Okay. And then we have what paces do they have to do? So you have the medium walk and the free walk, and we'll talk about the free walk later. We'll, we are looking at quality of paces. And then in the trot, you've got the working trot and then moderately lengthened strides. That's always difficult to judge because you've got horses that just speed up and you've got ones that look as if they're not going to be able to lengthen. Um, and when you're teaching people to do it, you want to show a difference. So you've got to have a look at the ability of the horse to see how can you trick the judge into getting a better mark than maybe the length and stride was. And that is all in the transition at the beginning, but particularly in the transition at the end, because that is when the judge is giving the mark. So if you slightly over steady and then you ride on again, the judge goes, oh, oh, and then they'll give you an extra half mark. And then in the trot, we have the stretch forward and downward where the pole needs to be pretty well level with the withers. And then in canter for grade three, it's just working canter, but it's on these circles. Okay. Then we go on to the expected standard in grade two. So confirming that, the, that you have the developing the thrust from behind so that the horse has to be more active, but within the activity, it needs to keep its balance. So for all that to happen, the horses have to be forward at the right tempo, which is the speed of the legs, and they have to be straight. And then you can start to get the throughness. And the rider maintains a more consistent contact with the bit, and I'm talking about that later. Okay, and here the, they have 15 meter circles from the different places. So they really have to understand about where you go on the circle. Then three and four loop serpentines. Leg yielding, the first time it comes in, it's a long one from D to R and in the Next test, it's a much shorter distance. And we'll also talk about that. And then there's the five meter loop on the long side, which is quite tricky to ride. So it doesn't look as if the horse leg yields back. But we'll also talk about that later. And then on to the next one, the paces. So you've got medium walk and free walk. And in trot, you've got working trot, lengthening the stride and lengthening the outline. And then in canter, just the working canter and the length and stride. So we'll talk about those later. Uh, now, the, you're looking for both these grades into a, a rider position that is going to be able to progress up the levels. So in the walk, the rider should keep the contact. And if the horse is walking correctly, it takes the rider's hands. And then as the rider's seat goes forward, the elbows come back and then you have a connection. It's very difficult and you see it all the way up the grades to Grand Prix. If the horse is not on the contact correctly, it's very difficult to change the walk the rhythm tends to go and the transitions within the walk are never smooth and you get a lot of resistance. In 
trotting, you're now expecting your riders to be on the correct trotting diagonal. And we'll talk about this later, about how you actually learn to come up. So many riders never seem to learn to come up on the correct diagonal. And that's a real worry to me because dressage is all about what you feel is happening underneath you. And I don't think coaches, I don't think we teach feel enough. And then in the sitting trot, I explain to people, so people sit and they bounce right up in the air. But then when you explain to them what happens, which is as they bounce up, the horse keeps going. So then they've got left behind. So then they go bang and that pushes them up again. So the quickest way and really the only way is to slow the trot. So some coaches say, well, just hold on to the front of the saddle and go with the horse. But that doesn't actually teach the rider to learn to go with the movement. So you slow the trot right down until it is barely trotting. And then the rider has an opportunity to get the idea of going with the movement. And then you can start to, and they'll suddenly feel it and go, wow, yes, now I understand. And then you can gradually do a bigger tempo. And then of course it's hard when you go canter into sitting trot because you've got to go with the horse straight away. So really your seat is saying, is telling the horse the tempo that you want to go. And you're, you, instead of letting your seat go up in the air, you make your seat go forwards. And once you get the feeling of it going forwards, then even if you bounce a little bit, you don't get left behind. Now, in the canter, the following of the arms is really important. And if you see a rider whose upper body is rocking backwards and forwards and they're trying to keep the horse going and the whole thing doesn't look very comfortable, if you have a look carefully, you'll see that the rider's elbows are going with their seat. So they're going at the same time as the seat. So then they go forward together and they go backwards together. But when you want to use your reins, when you want to use your outside rein and give it a squeeze or do a half halt, you do that as your hand comes back and as your seat goes forward. So if you have the timing wrong, then you actually end up restricting the canter and then it's very easy to lose the regularity and then you get a four beat canter. So in each pace, you've now got something as a rider and as a coach that you really need to be seeing, is this correct? Because this is the base of the future. And when you look at riders that are riding in Grand Prix, they all rode like you are riding now, but they have gone on from that up to Grand Prix. So anybody can actually go up the grades as far as they want to go. It's not easy and you have to really be dedicated to do that, but it is possible. Okay, next one. So, we went over this in the last one. It's two legs tell the horse to go. One leg says move sideways. And the seat, and this is the important thing, is that the seat's telling the horse how to go. So in walk and canter, it's the length of stride and how fast you want them to go. And in trot, it's mostly how fast you want to go with the tempo, but you also have to travel with your seat forwards when you want to have a longer stride. And when you want a shorter stride, then your seat does just a shorter following. Um, what tends to happen at these levels when the riders are trying to get their horses going in a round outline is that their seats are telling the horse to go and their hands are telling the horse not to go and then you have a lot of resistance. So 
when I'm teaching AIDS, so you say, well, what are the AIDS? They say, oh, inside leg on the girth, outside leg behind the girth and blah, blah, blah. But they don't say what they're doing. So when you're teaching riders or as a rider, you need to know exactly what you're using every aid for. So the outside hand controls if the horse goes too fast. So you use your outside hand as the horse's outside front leg is on the ground. And if the horse is going too fast, you go steady. And then a couple of strides later, steady again. And then you lighten. Because if you just pull then it's a bit like a racehorse at the end of the race. When they start to get tired, the jockeys pull more to hold the horse together. But that's not what you want for dressage. So you, you can change the tempo with your outside hand, but you actually hold the tempo with your seat. And the outside hand also, if the horse is falling in, your outside hand goes out to where you want the shoulders to go. Because if you don't take your hand out, then when you use your inside leg, the horse has nowhere to go. And if the horse is falling out on his outside shoulder, then you bring your outside hand close to the neck and say to the horse, keep your neck straight, don't bend your neck. Because if you don't let him bend his neck, he can't fall out. And then the outside rein also controls the outline and the roundness. But it only works if the horse is first forward, which means it's keeping itself going, at the right tempo and straight. Because horses use their heads and necks to balance themselves. So if they think, if they're crooked or if they think they're going to lose their balance, if they go too fast, they put their heads up in the air because the muscles on the underneath, not actually the underneath, but the side at the bottom of the neck, those are the muscles, their job is they're the brake. So if the horse goes too fast, it puts the brake on. And if they're crooked, they put their head the other way. So if they fall on their right shoulder, they'll put their head to the left. So if they're going to the right, they'll be falling in. And if they're going to the left, they'll be falling out. So we have to teach what the outside hand does. And then the inside hand asks for flexion and for bend and direction. Then the rider looks ahead of the direction of travel so that you're actually looking where you want to go. And then the rider's hips and shoulders stay parallel to the horse's hips and shoulders, which means that the rider now has to pay more attention to being straight in the saddle. Okay. Next one. So here we've got um, straight. And then when somebody sits sideways, you can see that this rider on the right-hand side is sitting to the left. So their left toe is going straight and their right toe will come out and then the back of the calf will be against the horse's side. So as a coach, if you stand on one either in front or behind the riders as they go down the long side, the first thing I look for is other toes doing the same thing. So people have different conformation so some people can have their toes to the front, but a lot of people, their thighs are a shape and their calves are a shape, but they actually can't do that. So what you're looking at is, are both the feet at the same angle? Uh, and then has a shoulder dropped and the left elbow will stick out and the head will be tipped to the right. So they'll have more weight in their left stirrup. Their right knee is likely to come up. So one of the things to do is to tell the right, is to show the riders how to self-analyze. And I use a lot of, have you got that, we can have that, I think the next slide might talk about that. 
No, just go back one then. We'll stick with that one. So I will say to the riders, have you got the same weight in both feet? Because if they have, then they're going to be straight. Then you can use, have you got the same weight in both seat bones? And the interesting thing is that there's far more information comes for your, from your feet to your brain than comes from your seat bones to your brain. So using have you got the same weight in both feet is much more effective than asking a rider, have you got the same weight in both seat bones? And then the elbows are so interesting because we use our arms to balance ourselves. So we use our heads and our arms. So when a rider's sitting crooked, they will not be able to ride with their hands the same. So one hand will go over so it's flat and one hand will have the thumb on top. Okay, next one. So now teaching, I talked in the earlier talk about people have different learning styles. So some people like to watch, others like to be told. The number that the percentage of people that learn best by watching is way above those that like to do it by listening. And then others are only interested in actually doing it. So if you can show somebody how, so if you have a rider in your class that can come up on the correct diagonal, then get them to do a demonstration first and then other people can copy. So the first thing is you have your rider in sitting trot and they tell you when the outside front leg is on the ground. And as a coach, let them do it, let them do it wrong maybe once and then help them. So you say it's coming down now, now, now. Uh, now, if you say, is it right? You've got right as correct and right as in right and left. And that is just so muddling. So I tend to talk about the outside front leg and are you correct? I don't actually use left and right. And research that they've done incidentally on right and left is only about 40% of people know right and left without having to go, ah, oh, this is the hand I write with, so this is my right hand. So it's quite interesting. So that's why I don't tend to use left and right. I use inside and outside. Um, so then they're sitting and you actually start your rising trot with a down and not an up. So you feel the outside front leg come down and then you go down, 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 up. And some people can learn it really quickly and other people uh, take a little bit longer. So then it might be something that you tell them to practice. If, you, if your rider looks to see what the legs are doing, by the time it's gone into their brain, they're never going to be able to do it by feel. So teaching feel is something I think we should do right from the beginning with our riders. Um, certainly, uh, as a coach, I look at a rider and you almost go, okay, well, they're at that level and you gear that on whether they can come up on the correct trotting diagonal. So it's something riders, uh, when you're in a dressage test and you're, you're rising, it, that, that is going to influence the judge, even though the judge is not judging you on your trotting diagonal. It just looks really good when you can come up correctly. Okay, so then you sort of go down, 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 up. Okay, yes, we'll go on to the next one. And then exercises uh, in changing the diagonal. And these are class lesson exercises, or if you've just got one rider or a couple of riders. So the first thing is when you're changing your diagonal, that you don't sit heavily. A lot of riders sit heavily. They also lean back. So of course, then that's going to affect the rhythm, the evenness of the steps of the horse. It's likely because when you suddenly sit down heavily, then it makes the horse go faster. 
So be aware of sitting with the same weight as you did when you were doing rising trot. And then you can change every fifth stride, for example. Uh, if you've got a class lesson, you could say, okay, you're all going to do the long way round to do it is you do 10 ups and downs on the right diagonal and 10 on the left and nine on the right and so on. Uh, or you just do one 10 and then you do nine. And it's really good because the riders start to become aware of it. And then when you get down to one, that's actually quite fun because you do, you do up, down, down, up, and then you go up again to two, three, and so on. Uh, and then you could say, okay, you're all going to change every four stride. And then now every seventh stride or whatever it is, because you're, you're getting the riders aware of the stride underneath them. And you're, they're also practicing so that when you change your diagonal, nothing changes. Okay. Next. Yes. Okay. So here is from my book and I really like it because in the middle, the thing about writing a book is you can put you, if you have a good illustrator, you can illustrate anything you want. And this is particularly what I wanted. So you've in the middle, you've got your straight horse and then you've got your horse who is flexed to the right. Now flexion is so tiny. The neck is very nearly straight, but they just, give a little bit to the inside and you have a hole up at the top of the neck when the horse is flexing correctly. And then on the circle, the one on the left, you can see that the horse is falling out. And I think it's really good for your riders because they tend to think if the head is out, the horse is falling out. But in this picture, they can actually see, oh yeah, the shoulders are going to the left and the head is coming in. And then the one at the top is the horse falling in. And so it doesn't lose its balance. The head is to the outside. And then the one at the bottom on the right is showing what correct bend is. So then you've got the correct flexion and underneath it, you've got the correct bend where you have an even curve through the horse's body on whatever size circle or corner you're asking it to go on. Okay, so here now on the bit. So on the bit really starts to come in in grade two, but some of the grade three riders, when their horses are going correctly, they will also be on the bit. So what we're looking at here is that when they're on the bit, the weight in the rider's hand and the weight in the horse's mouth is the same and the horse is actually taking the rider's hands. So you've got a round outline where the horse may be on the bit, but it may be being held in by the rider. And so particularly in, well, in all the grades, we're trying to get the horses going so they're able to be in a round outline. So you can put any gadget you like on a horse. It's not going to make, it's not going to really change the horse's way of going. So it goes well. Basically horses use their heads and necks to balance themselves. So you've got to make the horse go in such a way that it is able to be round and then it can be on the bit. Okay. Next one. Yes, yeah, so this is um, that the round outline is really just a position and on the bit is the way of going. Uh, but in order to be on the bit, the horse first has to be in self-carriage. Self-carriage means it is in whatever outline the rider wants it to be in and it is staying there itself. It is not being held up by the rider. And for this to happen, it's got to be forward at the correct tempo and straight. And I like to use forward tempo and straight because the riders can have then got something to work on instead of um, just 
pulling on the horse's mouth and giving it a kick, they can actually start to go, ah, oh, is it doing this? Is it doing something else? Okay, next one. So here we've got the one on the left is what you want. And then it's not enough just to say, well, if the horse is correct, its head is vertical, because that is not true. Because the middle one, the horse is on his under neck muscle. And the third one, the horse is too high with his pole or with his neck behind the pole. And you can see that it's, it's very tense through its jaw. Whereas if you go back to the first one, there's a lot more room between the horse's cheek and its neck. So that's more of a U, an upside down U shape, whereas the other two uh, from just behind the bit to the neck is more of a V shape. And when the horses go like the second and third one, that is never going to convert to being on the bit because both of those ones, the rider is pulling on the reins. And then the third one, the pole is not quite the highest point, which it should be. Uh, and in grade three, in the um, guidelines, it says to round the horse up while keeping him going. This is basic to any further progress in horse's behavior. So I think right from the beginning, we've got to be careful that they don't just pull the horse into an outline and think that's what we're looking for. Okay, next one. So here we've got a horse that's very relaxed, uh, but the pole is not the highest point. Um, you can see um, behind the pole where you've got the neck so that, if that's allowed to go on, that's actually what's called a broken neck. And they actually get a ligament damage there in the neck. So if any of you riders think you'd like to put running reins on horses to get them round, don't because you get too many permanent problems that you don't want. So this horse is very relaxed, it's just caught at this moment and she happened to send it for me to use. So thank you, Caitlin, uh, because that really shows, yes, the horse is round. Yes, he's using the top muscles in his neck, but he is not on the bit. He is not taking the contact. And in the judging guidelines, it says if the horse is overbent, that the judge should not be giving more than five, unless it's just for the odd stride. So we really don't want riders uh, doing a whole test with the horse behind the vertical. But there are lots of nice things about this. The horse is listening to the rider. He's actually doing what he's being asked to do. Okay, next one. Now, here we have the medium trot and the one on the left, the horse is taking, you can actually see it, taking the hands and the one on the right, which would probably look a lot flashier, um, is not. So the one on the right, the rider is holding the horse in an outline and its foot is flicked up. Now, the horse physically cannot put its foot down on the ground in front of a line that you draw down the horse's face. So if you look at the left one again, the right front leg is going to, you can see where it's going to be put down. And that will be just about in, just about underneath the face of the horse. Whereas the one on the right, and you can see there's a stiffness in the shoulder. Um, the one on the right is, the leg is going to come back before it gets put down on the ground. And the other thing that you're looking for is the leg should be parallel. So the one on the left, you can see that the front legs are pretty parallel, whereas the one on the right, 
the hind leg that's been picked up and the front leg, those should be parallel and they're not. So as riders, you can take video footage, you can get photographs and you can have a look at, have you got the base to progress? And it just needs to be correct. Okay. And here we've got the same horse. We've got Caitlin on um, Supernova. And the one on the left, you can see where the foot is going to go down on the furthest point to which it is pointing. And the one on the right has got a slight flick. So it's actually going to come back a little bit before it gets put down. So it's, I think it's the same test probably, just different directions. Okay, next one. And so here now we go on to the size of the corners. And I think as a coach, you've got to actually go over what size corner you want your riders to do. And here, um, Emily's showing flexion. The horse is a little bit low in front, but at grade three, that is okay. Because what we want is for a nice connection between the rider's hands and the horse. The horse is looking very confident. He's not at all fussed about what he's being asked to do, but this is in trot and you can see where K marker is. She, Emily's already left the track. So the size of her corner is going to be um, like a quarter of a 14 meter circle. So then she's not gonna have very much room on the short side. Uh, and then if she does the same on the other side and she has to then go across the diagonal, she's gonna be way past the marker. She'll be way past uh, F before she comes on the diagonal. So try and teach the right size. So it's showing correct flexion. Um, the pole isn't quite the highest point you can see the neck, uh, but I really like the contact and I like the relaxation of the horse and I like the understanding of the horse. Okay. Now, knowledge and feel are two separate entities. So first of all, you've got to have the knowledge. You've got to understand what is happening with your horse underneath you. So you have to have that knowledge to be able to then feel what's actually happening. And then you've got to be able to analyze what's happening. And then you've been, you have to be able to correct it or develop it. So as a rider, if you're coming across the diagonal and you want to lengthen, and it just says show a few length and strides, you're going to be working out as a rider, when have I got the trot absolutely right to be able to show correct length and strides? And this just comes back to feel, but the riders have to have the knowledge to be able to know what they're feeling. Okay, next one. Now, the walk, in the, most of the books, it gives you the sequence of steps of the walk, starting with a front leg and then going to the opposite hind leg. And that is because when the horse moves off from the halt, it moves off with a front leg first. But the problem is that the riders never learn, it just becomes too complicated. And so they don't learn what the sequence of steps is. So what I do is I teach hind front on one side, hind front on the other. And then once they, you, they stop and they move off from the halt and they see that it's a front leg that moves, then they don't get muddled about it. Um, so first of all, um, the rider has to identify which leg they stop with last. And that is 
usually, unless something happens in the halt, that's also the leg that moves off first. So in a class lesson, you can be saying to a rider, tell me when the inside front leg comes down. And then if it's correct, then you go on to your next rider. Uh, if they can do it well, then you ask them when the, the hind leg, oh, I can't see that. And yeah, so that's fine because you have to know, you have to start to develop. How can you do a square halt if you don't know where the hind legs are and the front legs are? So it's a nice thing on a hot day to do or when the riders need a bit of a rest, uh, they come and they just tell you which leg is doing which. And sometimes the riders will be all ready because you've asked for the inside front and they're all ready and you know they can do it. So then you ask them for the other one because they've probably looked to see and then they've kept it in their minds. Um, so then you want the, which front leg moves last. And then, so if they know what the sequence of steps is, if the horse halts, with its left front leg last, you know that the, if a hind leg is left behind, it will be the right hind leg. And so then you just gradually, some of your riders, because you never have a class with everybody at the same level, it could be that you're trying to get the front legs together and then a horse that can do that, then it's the hind legs together and a horse that halts square then you could be doing it out of trot, whereas someone else is trying to do it out of walk because what you're trying to do is get it correct. So within a class lesson, everybody will not be doing the same thing. Okay. Um, yes, so I think I've just gone over that. I have. So now the priorities of the halt. So you have the main, so the first thing is the halt has to be still. Then it has to be straight. And at the beginning of a test, those are the two things that the judge can really see. If, a hind, if the horse is dead straight and a hind leg is left behind and you only have one judge at sea, then they actually can't see where the hind legs are. Um, so it needs to be in a round outline uh, at grade three, you're wanting the head not to come up when the horse halts. But then we have a lot of horses that halt and they come over bent. So the pole goes too low. And then you want the horse to be balanced at the halt. Young horses will leave a leg behind or they will halt square and then they'll put a leg back to make a bigger base of support. So if you stand on one toe, you may not be able to keep your balance for very long, but if you're standing on two feet and they're about um, half a meter apart, you'd be able to stand there really well balanced. So if your horse is halting and putting a leg back, don't get cross with him, work out why he's doing it. And you'll just find that you've got to go a little bit slower into the halt so that he actually doesn't lose his balance. Now, the secondary things are that the pole stays the highest point into the halt, in the halt and in the move off. And that the horse is attentive and not looking around, so he's got to keep. It's a shame, riders, when you do a really nice halt and then you go to salute and you let your horse put his head to one side and look at something. The horse has to be attentive. The head, the horse's face has to stay facing the sea judge. And then that they move off directly when they're asked and also into the correct tempo. So some horses that in the tests where you can be progressive, then you can go into walk and trot. But in the higher levels where they have to go straight into trot, they should be going directly into the correct tempo. And that's quite difficult because the horse has to be pushing from behind. Then the 
transition into and out of the halt has to be smooth. So sometimes riders come in and they just go, whoa, and the horse comes to a grinding halt really quickly and it's not smooth at all. And then you look at, are the, the horse may be square, but are its hind legs out behind it? So when you're schooling the halt, it's all about, is the horse balanced enough to stay there and the horses that don't want to stand at the halt um, so they halt and then they move they move because they are nervous about the halt so when you school the halt two things never school it in a place where you do it in a test and never get cross with your horse so if you get a new horse and it doesn't halt, then you do something like come on a serpentine and every time you cross the center line and every time you touch the long side, you halt. But you only halt for a second because it has to be your idea to move on, not the horses. So you'll never teach a horse to stand still if it moves and then you keep jabbing it in the mouth saying, stand, stand, whoa, whoa, that doesn't work. I know, because I tried that years ago. Uh, so what you need to do is you're the one that says to move off. So if you only halt for a split second, that doesn't matter. That will build up to the horse being confident enough to stay in halt. Okay, next one. So when you're teaching the halt, uh, one quality at a time. So you're saying to the riders, work on the straightness or the accuracy or whatever else. Okay, next one. Oh yeah, if the here is wonderful, Caitlin. That is a fantastic halt. So just to go back to the other, but don't go back to the other one. If your horse halts crooked and you move off straight into trot, the horse will move off crooked. So if you know that you've the quarters have gone to the right because you've let the horse fall on his left shoulder, then walk on one step and then trot. Otherwise you just go even more crooked. But that is a really nice trot and Nova is listening to Caitlin. So well done, that's really great. Judges love having good halt. Judges actually love giving good marks. Okay. So now the half halt is talked about. And the first thing is, if a half halt is successful, what changes? And what happens is that when a half halt is successful, the horse's balance comes back a little bit. So it's a real, it's a rebalancing of the horse. And at grade two, when you really are starting to do it because you're starting to do length and strides in canter. It is used when you want to bring the horse back from length and stride, you check the roundness and then you do a half halt. What are the aids? Well, the aids are, um, and this is why when I teach, I don't often say the word half halt because the aids are a combination of leg, seat, upper body, hands, arms, and everything else. So it's what you need at the time. So I teach it by trotting, probably on a circle, and then saying you're going to check the roundness and then you're going to shorten the steps for three strides and then you're gonna ride on again. And if it was successful, the horse did not resist it. Uh, the difference between a lot of coaches talk about a check or well, they actually call it a half halt when what they really mean is just a squeeze on the outside rein. So if you're thinking about if you're cantering down the long side and you're lengthening and you want to come back to a working canter, you need to warm the horse so you give a squeeze on the outside rein that actually says to the horse, stay round, 
Then you say to the horse, now shorten your steps. If you just go down the long side and you say to the horse, now shorten the steps, it's very likely to put its head up and come above the bit. So a squeeze on the outside rein. And the other thing is that how you really do the half halt is if you think about having your elbows by your side, you are holding your hands and you push your seat towards your hand. So if you look at a whole lot of things that are written about it, um, it says that you are, you are pushing your seat forward into a resisting hand. But I just like to think about it as you hold your hand and then you push your seat forward and then you lighten. And the most important thing about the half halt is the lightening afterwards. Okay. So in a long rein outline, there's always great debate about how long the, how low the horse's head should be. And the pole level with the wither or slightly lower than the wither is what you want because when the head is down there, it frees the shoulders and then you've got full use of the horse's front legs. Okay, next one. And then you want, right. So then we go on to the canter and here you've got, it's all about how much suspension can you get? Because the more you get, the more you can transfer that into later on up the grades into collection and extension. So the horse on the left has got a good use of his inside hind leg. And he will have an over track with his inside hind leg of at least a meter. The horse on the right may be up a little bit more, but the inside hind leg has just taken a really small stride. So it would barely be over tracking at all. The other thing that you look for with the quality of the canter is the gap between the hocks. So the horse on the left has got about, in the picture, about two centimeters, whereas the one on the right hasn't even got a centimeter. And as you go up the grades, don't think that the height of the pole is collection. Collection is all about how much balanced suspension when all four legs are off the ground can you develop okay so the picture on the left actually doesn't show it very well but it is quarters in and a lot of horses go with quarters in uh, you may have a straight medium cat or show a few lengthened strides down the long side but when you steady the horse that tends to be when the quarters come in. And then the one on the right, you see a lot of horses on the circle looking a little bit like a motorbike. So that's both of those are not quite straight enough. Okay. So here we've got the big arena. And when you're teaching riders that are going up to grade three, uh, they need to know that you have a different meters between the markers okay and then people learn i uh just for the center ones i go don't like xmas in germany but you just make up a sentence so you know which letter is which i use sir sir at the top and at the bottom you've got vlp which is very lazy people so Sir is very important, so they're close to the judge, and very lazy people are as far away from the judge as they can get. So that's how I remember it. And I remember that F and P and B all look the same. And there are three V's in the letter K, and they're straight lines. And other people go, oh my goodness, I'd be completely muddled with that. So how people like to learn, they will work out how they like to think of the markers. Okay. So now we go on to your three loop serpentine. 
which comes into grade three and as well as two. So you need to teach the circles first and then you can just join them together. So I would be putting two cones two meters past I and then I continually say to the riders how far is C from I? They actually have to work out, they've got to be able to add together six and 12. So then you say, well, how many meters from M to the corner? How many meters from M to R? Uh, so how many meters do you have to go past the SR line and go past I? So yes, this bit of it is mathematical, but it's veggie maths. They've got a nearly enough fingers to do that if they need it. Because otherwise they think they're going to go between S and R and then when they come, then the circles are too small and then the serpentine is a horrible shape. So spend the time with your riders, um, making sure that the circles are correct. Uh, where you hit the long side, uh, so if you're on the right rein from C, you will be four meters past M now, some people like meters and some people like fractions. It's also a third of the way between M and R. So you can use meters or fractions. And when I'm teaching a class, I use both because you don't know how people learn. Okay. Now, this is, I really like this because people get very confused about these 15 meter circle. So now we're looking at grade two. And when you ride your 15 meter circle at C, you have 2.5 either side. From B, you have the five meters on one side. And then the, the four loop serpentine, the five meters are in the middle. And if you show them this diagram where you draw one yourself, then they, they can understand it because they can see it. Otherwise it's really muddling and they just don't ride good shapes. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I do it with a mathematical thing. So how wide's the arena? So how many meters are you gonna have spare? And I've talked about that. Um, also, we tend not to, if you have an arena up, get your riders before they get tacked up to come and actually walk the shapes. Where are they going to look? Uh, where are they going to go to? And it's quite good. Sometimes you can get a lunge line and you stand in the middle. And if the lunge line is 7.5 meters, then you have somebody on the end of the lunge line. They've actually got to go around the circle and then they see where it is that they have to go. But other coaches will have different ways of doing it, but actually showing it on the arena and then they can ride it. Okay. So here now, this circle at B, which comes into so many of the tests, people tend to make the widest point. So whether the two crosses, that come before the center line. That's 2.5 meters before the center line. So they leave B, and I talked about it last time, that the circle point is the middle of the stride. So you don't go to the circle point, you go to a meter before it. So you're actually going to about 3.5 meters before the center line, and then you turn, and to get to your halfway spot, you're making the circle smaller. Then when you come out of it, you cross the center line, making the circle bigger. Otherwise the riders just do 15 meters, but their circle point is on the center line. Okay. Now here we've got the fifth, the four loop serpentine. Um, the thing about this is that you actually started on the short side, 2.5 meters past C or A. If you start at C, you've stuffed 
it up before you've ever finished the first loop. So that's why it's really good to show it and show where this five meters is. So then you've got your 2.5 at the beginning and then at the end, you've also on the short side, 2.5 meters before. Then they're going to touch, well, they touch the center line. The middle of the stride is 1.5 meters past M because half of 15 is 7.5. So I would be putting a cone 1.5 meters past M and that is the middle of the stride. And then quite possibly four cones beside I marking where the five meters is. And then X is easier. And then I'll probably do the same in, at L so that the riders are actually riding correct movements. So they, 4.5 from, if you come down and look at between S and E, so they then, they are a third of the way between S and E, and then they go to X, and then they're two thirds, and then they're just before K. And some of your riders really like meters and other ones you've got to teach them before A, I and, and after L and stuff. So you'll get to know your riders, whether they're good at maths or not. Okay. But when you see a correctly ridden four loop serpentine, it's wonderful. And then uh, just, can you just go back again? Cause a really important thing is when you on the, so you're starting at C on the right rein, as you're leaving the long side, you take the, and you're just coming around before you get to the quarter line, you've taken the new outside rein, even though it's on the inside of the circle, because then when you come straight, in that five meters, which isn't very long, you want to be getting the new flexion. So then you can have a bend on the second loop. And then as you come out of this, off the long side, then you're taking the new outside rein again. Then you get the flexion. Because the judges are looking for change of flexion allows change of bend. So if you don't get the flexion, you're not going to get the horse bending. And they're looking to see, does the outline stay the same? Because often when you change the flexion, the horse will actually put his pole lower. So to get a really good mark, the outline stays exactly the same. And there are clear changes of flexion and bend. And of course, the shape's perfect. Okay. And I have... Oh, yes. Yeah. So if you're teaching it, um, I actually get them to stop at C and say where they're going to go, which is I'm going to go straight for 2.5 meters. And then they go to the next point and stop. Because if they ride, if they just follow another horse, uh, they don't necessarily ever learn where to go. Okay, and then and it takes a little bit of time, but then the riders have actually had to work out exactly where they're going. And as I talked before, error-free learning, if somebody only learns how to do it correctly, then they're never going to do it wrong. Okay. Now, this comes into all the different levels. It comes into grade three and it comes into grade two. Um, in yes so for 3.3 .3, the riders have to turn um left at e so it's just the other way around and then x they ride a 20 meter circle so they're going to ride a quarter of a 10 meter circle and then they are straight for 10 meters before they do another quarter of a 10 meter circle in one of the grade two tests, 2.3, there's actually 20 marks involved um, in this movement. They have to E turn left, X halt, and B turn right. So 
as you're coming around the corner, you're actually getting ready to halt. If you come around the corner and then you get straight and then you decide you're going to get ready to halt, you haven't got time. Because when you halt at X, your body is over X. And if you think about you've got at least a meter and a half behind you, um, so you haven't got very much room to get ready. So this is an exercise that is really good to practice, really good to coach because you can be either at B or E, they're coming towards you. They can start off with doing it in trot and then they can go into walk back into trot and then they can do the trot, halt, trot. And when you have the two 20 meter circles from X um, in 3.3, this movement is written at the beginning and at the end of it. And there has to be a diff to get a really good mark. Um, you show a difference between the turn at E and B and the 20 meter circle that starts at X. Okay. Next one. Ah, so in the grade two, you have um, leg yielding. And right from the beginning, teach and ride that your horse is straight. He's flexed away from the direction in which you're going uh, and he is going on a diagonal line. The, if you keep the horse's head facing the short side, then you won't get too much bend in the neck. But if you imagine this horse is going to fall on his right shoulder, before he's gone more than a couple of steps, he's going to have bent his head far too much to the left. So as a coach, if you're standing on the short side and you're looking at, and the riders are paying attention to, is the horse's face facing the short side, then you're not going to have a problem. And I've done a lot of teaching this because they have it in the para equestrian tests really early on with them. And so it's something that we have to teach and keeping the face facing the short side has made all the difference between riding it well and riding it badly. Okay. And this is a this is a, a wonderful class exercise. You can do it if you're just riding on your own, but the coach is on the right hand side, uh, and the riders come around and they might go between the so they come on the short side and then they turn right between the red poles and then they leg yield across and then they go through the brown poles. And then they turn left and they go down the long side, through the short side, through the blue ones, and then they leg yield again. And it's really nice because the riders have immediate feedback. You hardly have to say a thing. And the other thing that I like about it is that the riders then learn what aids they need uh, to keep the horse straight and then they'll find that one way the horse gets too much bend but it's dead easy to get across and the other way may be more correct but they don't quite get to the poles so it's a really nice nice exercise okay and then you're at the end saying is your horse now straight now the canter transitions are from different places um so if you have to go into canter and circle, and this comes in as the grades go up, um, whether you're late into canter, you've got to do the shape of the circle. Because if you're going to A, canter and circle, but you haven't turned as you get to A, then even if you're in canter, you're going to go way too close to the corner and then it's not going to be a circle, then it's gonna put you off. So look at the shape of the circle before you go into canter. So when you're coming around the corner uh, to get to A, you're already planning where you're going to go. And then the other thing is you've got to work out 
how many strides does it take to get the horse, your horse, into canter? And to get the correct leg, you give the aid, it doesn't matter if you're walking or if you're trotting, you give the aid as the inside front leg is on the ground. So as you come around the corner, you're feeling that inside front leg um, now, now, and then you give the aid. And it always needs to be a little bit earlier because the horse is moving forward. So as its head passes A, it needs to be cantering and coming on the circle. So work out how early you have to give the aid. And if you have a horse that tends to go on the wrong leg, then you would be saying to yourself, well, I think I might just canter really early on the corner, lose a mark because it's early, but get the right canter lead. But that's just arena craft and how you're going to get the best marks. But to get a really good mark, you're going to do into canter as the horse's head passes A and you start the circle. Um, where you go, FXH changed rein through trot, which is in one of the grade two tests. You count the steps, so it says three to five steps, and you count those with the front legs. Now, it's an odd number because if you did four steps, you'd be on the same leg. So as you go into trot, you are already feeling feeling the new inside front leg coming down and then you'll never be wrong with it which is really good um then another test in grade two r circle right 15 meters and then rf lengthen the canter so you want to as you finish a 15 meter circle you want to get your horse straight for one stride and lengthen. If you come around the corner and you're still circling, your horse is in a curve, and then when you say lengthen, then you're gonna find that the horse's quarters are in. So you actually want to finish the circle, straighten and go. And then at the end, you work out how many strides does it take to be able to go round the corner at F in a working canter and with a younger horse it might take four or five strides with a better balanced more advanced horse you might be able to say well I need to go check the roundness now half fault so it's only going to take three strides so you just work out how you can get the best marks um, then MF lengthen the strides between sorry MP and then between P and F develop working canter that means that you keep the length and strides until you have passed p and then you have time to be able to check the roundness and shorten the steps and what you probably will be doing is shortening twice so you check the roundness then you shorten then you shorten again, by which time you've got to F and you can ride a really nice corner. Okay. Now, this is this loop. Um, as you can see, it doesn't go very far and it's ridden mostly incorrect where the horse comes out. Let's say you're on the right rein, you come past K, you come out, and then they leg you all back and get back to the track at somewhere at S or wherever, but they're leg yielding back. That's not how you ride it. So you come through the corner, you go out, uh, have a look at where the quarter line is, get to it before level with X, ride straight, and then turn. So you actually have two turns. Well, you have more. You turn around the corner at K, you then turn to be straight on the quarter line, and then you turn to be straight facing F, and then you bend them through the corner. And 
if you ride it like that, then at the higher levels, when you ride the 10 meter circle, that's actually much easier to ride than the, I think, than the five meter one. Okay, so I think we've covered what we're going to. So happy riding, coaching and judging. And are there any questions? So I have a, I have DVDs called Ride Towards Excellence, which are available on my website. And I was talking to Kathleen about giving the Pony Club a very good rate on those. And then the Pony Club can actually make some money off them. So if you're interested in buying them, contact Kathleen at the office. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for your time. That was fabulous. Thank you, Mary. Um, I'm just having a look through the chat. Um, so if we have any questions. A couple of people had to head out early. Uh, they had other meetings on. Now, the, question, the first question we have is from Lauren and she asks, have you got any tips for riding the canter changes up the centre line grade two? Um, I don't think that's in the new test, is it? No. But so, if, it, if it was, yes. So I'm imagining this is through trot um, and your you have to get the, you have to practice. I certainly would not be practicing it on the center line. I'd be practicing it on, um, off it in case you have problems schooling. Then when you come to do the test, your horse doesn't go, oh, this is where, where we have a problem. So I'd be doing it on the diagonal first or a short diagonal first and getting the horse very straight because the thing is, when you're going on the diagonal, the horse has an inclination that it's going to go the other way. So that makes it easier to get the correct canter. Whereas the difficulty factor of doing it down the center line is that you go into trot and it's not obvious what you want to, which canter lead you're going to want. So counting the steps and feeling the inside front leg on the ground when you give the aid is going to give you the correct lead. But you also have to, so you, you trot and then you have the new outside rein and you flex and you canter. So you can never give more than one aid at once to a horse because it can't interpret it. So um, the the aid of, so the timing of the aid is going to be very important. Yeah. So yeah, just confirming in the, in the new grade two test there. Um, it's on the no, diagonal. Yeah. And uh, the grade one is where there's a simple change on the centre line. Yeah. So um, the next question uh, Ah, Lauren just clarifies, not changes, just back to trot, which I think you went through. Um, yes, the recording, we have recorded. So um, everybody who registered prior will get an automatic copy of the recording. Um, uh, the next question is from Bev. How do you teach riders a good entry at A? Um, yes, <laughs> with difficulty with some of them. So the first thing is that the entry is usually two meters wide and the riders have to go in the middle of it. And so the first thing you do, and so we tend not to practice that. So if, if you don't have a proper arena, just put two cones or two something that has the gap of two meters. So the riders can practice coming in the middle of it. And then 
telling them where to, so the actual entry with where the A marker is, they need, to, if they're circling, if they're coming in on the right rein, they're not going to pass the A marker. They're going to use the A marker to be close to it, to give them the straight entry. The crooked entries happen when the rider goes round the marker because then they're going to bend right and then bend left. And then you're stuffed before you ever get in there. So even if there isn't a lot of room, you do not want to go past the A marker. And people think it's fine just to enter somewhere between the... Um, entry markers. It's not. It's got to be dead centre. Thank you. Mary, have you got any tips to help a horse that is naturally heavy on the forehand to sit up more? Thank you for a great session. Um, yes. I think that working with trot poles and things can be really good. So I would be doing a lot of um, different trot pole exercises because when the horse that's heavy in front, when it goes over a pole, it actually has to pick its feet up. I would not be doing poles that were raised off the ground. I'd actually just be doing the poles because if the horse is on the forehand and you're asking it to go over a pole that's... Um, 30 centimetres high or 20 centimetres high, it's just going to go hollow in its back and you don't, you, you're just going to hurt it. So I have a look at, um, on the forehand, it's, uh, is when the horse's withers drop down. Now, I do a lot of long rein in my working in, but I never do long rein trot until the horse is first in self-carriage. Because I think that we put the horses on the forehand. So if you warm the horse up and it's got a lovely free moving walk, uh, <coughs> that's fine. Don't interrupt with that. But when you want to trot, the horse should be starting in a working outline and coming through. I never do long rein until the horse is in self-carriage. So I think that we tend to warm the horse up on the forehand and then complain it's on the forehand. Look, some horses are built downhill and it's not so easy, but I would be checking that the warming up changes. And then if the horse needs a break, I'd probably stand with it and not let it do long rein again because then the withers are going to drop down again and then you're going to have a problem bringing it up again. I don't know if that answers your question. I think that was a great answer. Uh, Bev just uh, popped another message in and said that she often finds when judging that riders do rush the entry. So thank you for your ideas and explanations with that one. The next question is from Jenna. When doing serpentines, are judges looking for riders to change their diagonals when changing direction in the loops? Yes. If you do a loop on the long side, a 10 meter loop, which comes into some tests, um, you don't have to, but on a three or four loop serpentine, yes, you would. And you do that as you cross the center line. But there is no, there is no hard and fast rule. I mean, some people probably don't. Some of the riders might be on the wrong one the whole way through. So hard think, um, be right. <laughs> another uh, one I've just thought of, Mary, is um, often the question is when you're changing rain across the diagonal, where should you change your diagonal? Some riders oh. change it at X. Is if that you're the... Okay. If you're lengthening, you usually do it at the end. Some if people like to do it at the beginning and do a push-off but then I think you've probably ruined the rhythm of the horse. Uh, if, you're, if you're lengthening, you never do it at X. But if you're going on a diagonal line, oh that 
doesn't lengthen, it's normal to do it at X or it could be done at the end. Thank you. Well, I think that seems to be all our questions, Mary. Good. So we have, um, yeah, lots and lots of thank yous and um, some, some great positive feedback, Mary. So on behalf of Pony Club Victoria and everybody else, uh, actually, one more question. Imogen's just quickly popped one in. Um, do you have any tips on how to get a horse straight if they're falling in on the long side with their hind end? Oh, yes. Okay. So the... What you have to look at is what is a cause and what's a result. And if the hindquarters are coming in, it's because the shoulders have gone out. So then if you think, oh, well, the quarters have come in, so I'm going to push them out, all you're actually going to do is push the shoulders out more. So you. if the horse is going along with his quarters yeah. in, then you would get the horse very straight. Um, you might even counter flex them to the outside, but basically it's the outside shoulder that you want to straighten. So then I would be coming on, instead of a circle, I'd come on the shape of a 50 cent coin. So you have little straight sides and turns down one end and then see, have you got your horse straight enough that he can go down the long side straight. Yeah. But the fork is in is a result, not a cause. I'm going to be talking about cause and result in the next one. Thank you. And um, so before we go, just a reminder for those who might have missed it at the start of the webinar that Mary's presentation for Grade 1 and Advanced will be Thursday, the 22nd of October at 6.30 p.m. So keep an eye uh, in your emails and on the website. For and if people have good photographs that they'd like me to have a look at, possibly include, send them to Kathleen. Yeah. We would love lots of photos. And thank you to those who um, offered their photos up tonight, in particular yes. the Lang Warren girls. Um, it's very I would like to thank Kathleen for organising the my presentation. Again, thank you very much. My pleasure. Um, yeah, so I think uh, we will say good night and thank you, and we hope to see you at the next one um, very soon. Good night, everybody.